April. Wow. We'll start our meeting this morning with the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Supervisor Vanderpool, and then a moment of silence. Please join me in saluting our country's great flag. Ready, salute. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, our first item this morning is Supervisor Matters, and I will start to my right with uh, Vice Chair Valero. Pull up my mic. All right. All right, great day to Larry County. Last Tuesday, I failed to share that I attended a prayer at the poll for students in the Cutler Rossi Joint Unified School District returning back to school. There were a good number of teachers and staff there who shared encouraging words with one another. It was a great to be there before the Board of Supervisors meeting last week. I want to give a shout out to HHSA staff and the Sequoia Community Center Board for organizing a great vaccination pod last Tuesday morning. Although I was unable to attend, it was great to hear that over 40 people were vaccinated at the center. Thank you, HHSA, for vaccinating our mountain communities. Our RHD um, interviews went very well on Wednesday. We had great candidates, all with a passion and desire to help Tulare County move forward. Thereafter, I traveled to Traver for the book machine unveiling at the Traver Elementary School. Unfortunately, Traver Elementary does not have a library on campus, nor in the community. Teacher Liz Rodriguez must, mustered up a group of seventh and eighth graders for a step-up challenge. The step-up project was awarded first place, and now the project has come to fruition. Not only is the county providing the book machine on campus, but the county library will also provide resources to the Traver Community Center. The bookmobile was also on hand during school hours and for the afternoon event as well. It was the first stop ever for the bookmobile. Thank you so much to Larry County Library. That evening, I attended the State Water Board East Arosi Arosi Consolidation Meeting. Residents were able to express their concerns to state water staff. Unfortunately, it felt like a repeated meeting with residents concerned about the delays in the process. They are hopeful that the new administrator role will help move closer to consolidation. Thankfully, we all had time to make our voices heard and urge the State Water Board to move conversations into action. On Thursday, the Leadership Northern Tillery County cohort had its day session meeting focused on green technology. Conversations included those with Rebecca Gladden from Site Logic, a tour of Dinuba Solar Farm, a site visit and tour at Pena's disposal to learn more about the reusable efforts and resources among other speakers and activities. On Friday, I had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Galley again through our monthly Latino Caucus of California Counties meeting. He discussed ramped up efforts on vaccine allotment and urged counties to continue to work on identifying our hard to reach populations. As county representatives, we also had the opportunity to share some of our concerns and struggles with the state. Saturday was another very busy day. I traveled to Drum Valley in the mountains northeast of Erosi. In the AM, I participated in the Drum Valley School Monument unveiling. It was a beautiful drive up the hill and back to the valley floor. And just a few tidbits on the Drum Valley School. Settlers in the area initially settled on the edges of the surrounding mountain for access to fresh water. And as a result, schools started to pop up throughout the surrounding areas in the 1890s. In 1912, the land had been granted to the school for use. And this was initially a joint venture between Fresno County and Tulare County due to it being on county lines. 
and from 1912 to 1942, the school held classes but closed when the U.S. entered World War II. So again, thank you to the Tulare County Historical Society and the Ledbetter family for your contributions to Tulare County. That afternoon, I traveled to Ivanhoe's Clink Citrus to visit the state-run OptumServe site and talked with people about their experiences. I then went over to the Woodlake Community Center where I helped the UFW distribute food and observed the Woodlake OptumServe vaccine location where I also received, received my first vaccine. This week, I have an interview with First Five Tulare County regarding a home visiting coordination needs assessment. I'll also be attending the TCRTA ad hoc meeting for an executive search update as we look for a director to oversee the Tulare County Regional Transportation Authority. I plan to attend the Erosi Vaccination District Clinic at the Family Resource Center. On Friday, I will attend the Monson Sultana Vaccination Distribution Clinic and then follow up with another site visit to the Ivanhoe Memorial Hall Vaccination Clinic on Saturday. I also want to thank staff for helping to prepare a town hall event for the community of Goshen. And lastly, congratulations to our new Tulare County Fire Department's newest lieutenants. And that is all I have, Chair. Okay, that's our time for today. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> all right, uh, Supervisor Macari. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this last week, I attended the uh, interviews for our Human Resources Director with the rest of the board. I attended the uh, promotions for the Sergeant Tulare County Sheriff's Department. I want to congratulate each and every one of them uh, for a job well done in their promotions. Uh, I, with uh, Supervisor Vanderpool and, and Chair Shuckley, and I attended the roundabout opening at Santa Fe and Tulare. Whereby I say that was a, a beautiful, turned out to be a beautiful project, and it seemed to be working really well from what we saw afterwards. Uh, I attended a CSAC Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Forum, which was quite informative, and it was good to see what other counties were doing and uh, on leading the path on, on working on equity and inclusion. Uh, I, on Friday evening, I attended a, an unfinished life exhibit, uh, which is art exhibit uh, for uh, Victoria Mueller, also known as Tori. Uh, Chairman Shuckling was there. She actually uh, emceed it. And... Uh, Tori uh, was a victim of suicide. Uh, we got to see the talents she had. That we've, I know her family, and they weren't even aware of the, the art, artistic talents she had. And it was a very tragic story. So again, I want to urge anyone, if you know someone needing help, um, if you start seeing some little indicators, please reach out. Family Services, uh, HHSA, 211. We need to do everything we can to help these people that, that just need uh, some help. I know that a lot of things, a lot of time and effort was put into helping Tori, but she just couldn't overcome uh, the tragedy she'd suffered in her life. Uh, yesterday, I was on a, uh, with Chief Bonwell, was on a tour of probation. It was a very beautiful building, and it was great to see how far they've come from uh, what I remember back in the days of working with the county. And uh, I, yesterday afternoon, I attended a Greater Cahuilla GSA board meeting uh, with Supervisor Vanderpool. I'm the alternate on that committee, and so I was able to make it in, in person this time. Uh, this week, I'll be attending the Crystal Apple Awards, which will be honoring some educators uh, for their hard work. There's also a Peace Officer Appreciation Barbecue coming up that I'll be attending. I'll be making a visit at the Lindsay Point of Distribution, and it's, I'll be volunteering at the Three Hours Point of Distribution. Uh, there's a uh, tree dedication at the Gateway Inn, and uh, Glenn reached out to me. Uh, he's doing a tree dedication for the COVID victims on a Friday evening, so I'll be up there with him and, uh, for this dedication. And on Monday, I'll be meeting with the Farmersville mayor and city manager. Thank you. Okay. Is that the new, <coughs> new probation building you got a tour of? The Kmart building? Wow, you're special. <laughs> okay, Supervisor uh, Townsend. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. A um, few things to report on. Uh, last week on the 6th, uh, we got together here, uh, here in A&B and uh, worked on a forestry uh, management video that HHSA has been putting together uh, over this last uh, oh, roughly 
close to, well, right after the SQF uh, fire, uh, right as we could get back up in there is when they started working on it. So um, came in here and, and recorded a little segment on that, and also uh, thanks, so thanks to them for setting up all of their, uh, their equipment in here and coming over for this video segment. And then Denise England also got her in there and got her expertise on forestry and, and water and the, the watershed up in the mountains uh, on that video as well. So that should be coming out um, in the, probably by uh, June or July, they'll have that video uh, ready that we can use uh, in our lobbying efforts uh, at the state and federal level just to uh, take care of the forest and do some creative things uh, for better forest management. Uh, also on the 7th, has been mentioned, uh, we had our uh, HR and D uh, interviews, and those went uh, very well. There'll be some announcements coming out here today, I'm sure. And then uh, on the 7th also, Local Area Formation Commission, or LAFCO, uh, we had our meeting here. Uh, there were a few housing uh, annexations from Dinuba and in Visalia. Uh, there was one detachment from the Portville Irrigation District. And we also approved our uh, budget and work program for, uh, for this fiscal year. And on the 8th, uh, I chaired the Sustainable Corridors Committee uh, regarding work around uh, Highway 65, 99, 190, and 198. And we got together, had some reports on the progress on, there's a couple of projects working on uh, litter abatement projects, so some exciting things coming up this year on that, getting rid of some of the, uh, the litter along the highways, putting together a, a program for that. Uh, and then some beautification screening projects also uh, coming along. We talked a little bit about the work on Highway 190 and the coordination with the Mighty 190 Committee. There was a report on the uh, Lindsay Welcome Sign and also uh, some work going on in Visalia along the 198. So there were some good things happening on our major corridors. Um, on the 9th, I had a, a Zoom call with uh, Congressman Valadeo um, and uh, Clayton Smith, his local representative. Uh, they called as a follow-up, they had reached out um, regarding some funding opportunities that we might have in the rural communities. Uh, some of them parks improvements, maybe some uh, sewer improvements, water. Uh, and so thanks to our, uh, our CAO and staff for putting together a list that uh, Supervisor Vanderpool and I um, threw some things out there that we thought might uh, be good projects for that. And then uh, I had that call along with uh, Supervisor Vanderpool with uh, the Congressman so just sort of touting those projects and, and prioritizing, and hopefully we can have some funding that will come down the line uh, as a result of that. Uh, and on the, on the 12th, uh, we had a follow-up uh, with Solid Waste and RMA and uh, Supervisor Vanderpool uh, regarding an idea that he had, and he'll talk about it, about a pilot program with uh, uh, some refuse abatement, nuisance abatement. And uh, I just thought, I just wanted to say it was a really creative conversation. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, RMA for being on there and for, uh, and Solid Waste for coming up with uh, some ideas for funding uh, of the program. So we'll look forward to the next couple of years uh, to see that come to fruition. And also wanted to thank uh, RMA, uh, uh, Reed, and also uh, Johnny Wong with Rhodes there uh, getting on the Western Divide Highway. Uh, that was open as of yesterday uh, over the top. Uh, you know, the bad news is there's, there's no snow, <laughs> and so they were able to open it. The good news is uh, they were able to open it a little quicker, so for the businesses and, and the, the tourists that want to, uh, uh, and the people that want to visit, uh, they, can, they can make that across all the way over the top. Um, also, I had a call yesterday with uh, Californians for Energy Independence, and uh, uh, there, there's some legislation at the state level that, uh, um, that they would be, it would be uh, the antithesis of what they want to do. And so I want to thank uh, the CAO and, and, uh, and our chair uh, for getting that item on the agenda along, along with, uh, I guess, uh, the other uh, San Joaquin Valley counties are also addressing uh, this issue. And so um, it was just a nice reminder of our networking with other counties um, that we can all sort of be on the, on the same page with some of this legislation uh, because we have very similar issues here in the Valley. Uh, later today, I have a call with, uh, uh, with Ken Hopper, Hopper in the morning, talk about some of these updates. And then on the 14th, I'm going to go and uh, attend the uh, um, SETCO meeting in Porterville, where uh, our own Mike Washam will be uh, the speaker. So it'll be fun to hear what's happening there. And also on the 14th, Harmony Advisory, uh, Harmony uh, Academy of Engineering Advisory Board meeting. 
And on the 16th, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one for the team and uh, participate in the Sarah View Foundation Golf Tournament <laughs> <laughs> for River Island. So I'm sure you know, that'll be a tough day, uh, especially for the other people that are playing on my team. <laughs> anyway, that's it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Vanderpool. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. A couple things uh, that have not been covered yet. It seems like Board of Supervisors Matters has been quite thorough this morning. Um, <laughs> Uh, yesterday we had a, a Greater Kauia meeting. I thought that went really well. I think that uh, uh, really I think what residents are starting to be most concerned about, uh, they know these plans are taking place. They know that the fees are starting to come out. What are their allocations of water going to be that they're going to be allowed to pump each year? Uh, so we're really starting to get those questions coming uh, back from stakeholders and um, there's still some conflict and uh, uh, real uncertainty out there uh, surrounding the actual amount of groundwater that's going to be uh, considered sustainable and allowed to, to be pumped from the ground at each year. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. Uh, the Water Commission meeting went very well. We did say uh, farewell on the Water Commission to uh, Farmersville City Council Member uh, Paul Boyer, who's been a, a longtime uh, Water Commissioner, uh, done a great job over the years really representing uh, disadvantaged communities and uh, small communities very, very well. Um, he worked hard on behalf of self-help and uh, uh, really worked in a pr pragmatic way and, and he's going to be missed. So uh, all the best to him in his retirement, although he did say he's working harder physically in his retirement uh, than he's ever had to work mentally uh, throughout his career. Um, there's a retirement board meeting uh, this Wednesday at 8.30. Um, that's followed up by an investment committee meeting at 10.30 uh, at the Tessera uh, board office. Uh, this Friday, there's a golf tournament for the Salt and Light uh, organization. Um, that is at 10 o'clock at the Solari Golf Course. Hopefully that uh, uh, will be a successful event. I know that uh, the project is uh, well underway as, a, as of a recent action by the board a few weeks ago. Um, that uh, project's taking place in Goshen, but I know that the effort to fundraise and expand is still uh, uh, ongoing. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to mention that uh, TCAG has a board meeting, regularly scheduled meeting at 1 o'clock here in these chambers on uh, next Monday, April 19th. That's all that I had for today, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor. I also will be participating in the golf tournament on Friday, so Thank God you, better hope your you're, team. you better hope, well, you better <laughs> hope you're not on the team in front of me. That's all. I, all right. So uh, last week, a lot of meetings, mental health board. I also attended the... Uh, Sergeant's promotions, that was good to see. On Thursday, uh, the Santa Fe Roundabout, uh, which is half in my district and half in Supervisor Macari's district, so just go round and round for a while. You can hit both of us. Um, as Supervisor Macari said, I, I was at the art show, uh, Unfinished Life, for Tori Muller. Um, as he said, unfortunately, in last November, uh, Tori took her, her life, and I just want to thank her mother, uh, Paula, for being so open and and um, getting sto uh, Tori's story out there. Tori was also at a very young age a, a victim of sexual assault, and too many times uh, families, you know, want to uh, stuff what's going on, and that I think that just helps with the stigma or promoting the stigma of of sexual assault, of suicide, and mental health issues. Um, so thank you, Paula, for that. Um, on Monday, a Tulare County Economic Development Administration meeting. Uh, yesterday also was our Health Advisory Committee meeting. We had an update from our lab and also from Dr. Hot on COVID-19. And we also received um, an update uh, regarding the ACES AWARE program. And the ACES AWARE is an initiative led by the Office of the California Surgeon General and the Department of Healthcare Services to give Medi-Cal providers training, clinical protocols, and payment for screening children and adult with ACEs. And ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. So uh, thank you again uh, to those folks that are heading that up for the county. I also uh, did a video for RMA regarding our adaptation and resiliency plan. Tomorrow I have a WIB meeting, Thursday an Air Board meeting. So, um, thank you, everybody, for being so busy this week. And I do have time for a tour of the new probation building next week. So just, just letting you know. Uh, 
So with that, we will move on to our uh, proclamation. This is a proclamation to present, to recognize the week of April 17th through 21st as National Public Safety to Telecommunicators Week. And uh, Supervisor Townsend will be presenting that. Okay. Well, it looks like we have, well, there's a lot, yeah, a lot of uniforms. Come on up. I was going <laughs> to say we have, uh, we have Chief Norman, we have Division Chief Marquez. We have, it says, Gloria's here, the, the dispatch supervisor. Come on up. And then a lot of other people. Well, who's I, I suspect these are, these are dispatchers. <laughs> Come on up. Just right, right there is good for now. I'll, uh, I guess I can read the proclamation. Or do we have a presentation first, a PowerPoint on this? We do? We do. Do you want to watch that? Well, let's watch that first. And then we'll make the, pro uh, the so are you going to help with that? Is it on that one? Okay, well, I'm showing my incompetence. Where is it? Oh, there we go. Thanks, Matt. And Pete, you can take off your mask if you'd like. I feel like the chief yeah. me up on that one, but. So we'll <laughs> Good morning. Um, again, I'm Pete Marquez, the division chief. Wait for this to come up. National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. Um, our dispatcher of the year, we choose a dispatcher every year that, um, that's chosen to be the dispatcher of the year for their accomplishments. And we just like to highlight somebody. Uh, while they all do an outstanding job, we just pick somebody so they know that we acknowledge the hard work that they do. This year it was Amy Martinez. And we're gonna try to present her with an award at a later time. Some of our stats. This year we had a total of 19,789 calls. Those weren't just Tulare County Fire Department calls, there are other calls that were generated by our cooperators. So as you can see, almost 20,000 calls in a year that was a little bit slower. So they're, they're quite busy in the dispatch center. Um, Gloria Samoz, our dispatch supervisor is here. She's been with us quite a while and she's a very good colleague to work with. She keeps the place running. Uh, two of our lead dispatcher threes uh, they assist Gloria when she's not there, so we always have a, a lead person, one of which is here, Melissa Hernandez, and the other, Jody Adney, wasn't able to be here. And our dispatcher twos, Jennifer Cowan, Delilah Elizondo, Cheyenne Gist is here, and we already talked about Amy. And then our dispatcher ones, Justine Bunker's here, Lori Dixon's here, and Madison wasn't able to be here. And then we also have extra help dispatchers, which are very valuable to the department. Um, they help with, with covering vacation, sick leave. When we send some of the dispatchers out of county for the larger um, fires, they're able to step, step in and fill those vacancies. And they're very effective. That's Deanna Lavender and Mia, who's here, right? That's not Mia there. And lastly, I'd just like to say thank you to all our dispatchers. We couldn't do this without you. you know, they're very competent at what they do. Um, they work long hours like the firefighters do that you can tell in the way they handle business that they care not only about the firefighters But they also care about the community members out there and every day they fa face different challenges because although what they do is routine They get different calls that they have to think differently to make sure that the county the citizens of the county get the best service they can so That's all I have. Thank you Okay, were you gonna say something to chief before or you after? Before? Yeah, Jason always says make this brief, uh, so we made it Pete Marcus brief, not Charlie Norman brief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always thinking about us. Thank you. Get in there. All right. Well, I have a proclamation here that I'll, that I'll read verbatim, uh, but just uh, just to kind of echo, you know, you know, he said you couldn't do it without you, and we all understand that uh, that you're a major part of this system. It doesn't get done uh, without that. I've had some. 
had some friends and actually family that have been dispatchers for uh, both the sheriff's department, uh, police departments, uh, and fire. And so uh, I get to hear some of the stories. I'm sure you have some crazy stories <laughs> out there, but, uh, but just know that we all really do appreciate you. We understand that, uh, uh, that you are there, that you're the, the first ones that get contacted, right? You're the first ones that hear about it and, and, uh, and have to do the, the dispatch, and we appreciate your part, uh, the part that you play. So I will read this recognizing April 11th through 17th, 2021 is National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require fire, emergency medical services, or police, and whereas when an emergency occurs, the prompt response of firefighters, paramedics, and police officers is critical to the protection of life and the preservation of property, and whereas the safety of our firefighters and police officers is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone the Tulare County Fire Communications Center, and whereas public safety telecommunicators are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services, and whereas public safety telecommunicators are the single vital link for our firefighters and police officers by monitoring their activities by radio, providing them information, and ensuring their safety, and whereas public safety telecommunicators of the Tulare County Fire Communications Center have contributed substantially to the suppression of fires, treatment of patients, and apprehension of criminals, and whereas each dispatcher has exhibited compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job in this past year. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors for Tulare County declares the week of April 11th through 17th, 2021, to be National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in Tulare County in honor of the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our city, our county, and citizens safe. Dated April 13th, 2021, and signed by Supervisor Larry McCarry, Supervisor Pete Vanderpool, Chair Amy Shecklian, Vice Chair Eddie Valero, and Supervisor Dennis Townsend. Congratulations, and if you want to all come up here into the well, we'll, get a, we'll have a photo op. <laughs> Congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Pete. And uh, thank you. I'm going to say ladies because they're all ladies here today. Um, you know, we get a, a weekly report from Chief Norman. As we know, we get thousands of calls for service uh, th for the fire department throughout the year. Um, and just know that every one of those calls goes right through uh, these folks here. Uh, they are that initial point of contact for folks when they call 911, and that is so important. Uh, what a job. You know, I watch 911. I watch 911 Lone Star, so I know. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's a, a lot worse than, than, than they even show on TV. So uh, <clears throat> thank you for your hard work and dedication, and hopefully later this year uh, we'll be uh, having, having a new home for you. So we look forward to that, too. Anybody else have anything they want to say? Feel free. Uh, Madam Chair, thanks for the opportunity. Just want to say thank you to our dispatchers. Really do appreciate your dedication and uh, effort that often goes unrecognized and unnoticed. But uh, that soothing voice on the other line to a member of the public is so critical. Uh, and your guidance and uh, dispatching, coordinating the response to whatever emergency you're posed with uh, is just truly commendable. Um, very, very difficult situations, very difficult to think uh, so quickly, but you do a wonderful job, and just want to let you know that you're appreciated. So thank you, Supervisor Valero. Yeah, I'd just like to echo Supervisor Vanderpool's comments, 
And again, going back to the comfort that you provide with someone on the other line, someone that you do not know, uh, but being able to direct them to peace, comfort, and, and the ability to care for the other. And so I just, again, want to thank you for your, uh, the service that you provide, uh, but also for, for being that connector, that bridge, and that guide um, for safety. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Macari. I just want to say thank you. I, I know firsthand the hard work you do and the things you have to encounter. And a lot of people don't understand exactly what you hear on the other side of the phone. So I just want to say thank you very much. And, and truly, we could not do it without you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Our next item is to receive an update from the Health and Human Services Agency on COVID-19 status and the response efforts in Tulare County. Mr. Lutz. Good morning, um, Chair, members of the board, CEO Council. Um, I have a fairly brief report today. Um, again, I think we're kind of in a good rhythm and cadence right now with um, COVID, but a few areas that I, I would like to highlight um, for everyone. Um, we are up 125 cases over last week, which is a, a quarter of a percent increase over um, the prior week. Important to note, our, our weekly cases have shown an increase in um, about 15%. And again, we're talking smaller numbers right now, still, um, still historically low for COVID response. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on a couple potential causes there um, and highlight um, the fact that right now, I, I think we're just monitoring before we're, we're getting too concerned about what those metrics look like. So our case rate, um, 3.4 per 100,000. Um, that state's um, unadjusted case rate for us was 3.3, so we're in line with the state. The um, positivity, 1.9%, um, which again continues to be in that yellow tier range. Um, and importantly, nice to note this week, our um, HPI lowest quartile testing positivity also um, lining up with our overall average positivity. And then um, our effective continues to, to more or less stay within that, um, that 0.7 range, um, a, a point up this week from um, 0.76 to 0.77. And then hospitalizations have remained um, at 17 where we were at last week. Um, I. Clearly, we our, our metrics, although they showed some minor adjustments, um, both do remain firmly within the state's orange tier. Um, and, and there are a couple things that I would um, point out and note. Last week, early last week, the state reported that there was a data error, um, as they occasionally do to us. Um, where um, some cases that were not that were not reported immediately from prior weeks. So what that of course does is then skew um, what our what our perspective numbers looked like. And to illustrate this point, last week's report I um, said we were at 3.2 per 100,000. Well, after making that adjustment, our our case rate would have actually been 3.65 per 100,000. So. When you look at it in context of today's 3.4, we actually are, are more or less still within that range, if not still seeing that, that slight decrease. So that's, that's one area where we, we feel like it's you know, one week, small change. Um, we feel that we want to continue to, to see how the trending goes over the next week or two. Um, I, I would note we um, did um, confirm that we had two additional UK variant strain cases that were detected in the county. Um, that brings a total of five um, that we've identified in the county of the UK variant and the one um, variant of um, the South African case. Can I, uh, quick question. Um, do we know kind of the severity of those cases, uh, whether or not they've been hospitalized, whether or not do not require hospitalization. Is there any information on um, that? The last I had heard, none of those cases were hospitalized, but I will um, let me confirm that and I'll, I'll send a note back. But at this point, um, um, my understanding was they were not. Okay. 
um, and, and again, we continue to work um, with the state lab, do the contact tracing um, to, to again, try and identify. The, the challenges with, with these, um, frankly, is the lag to do the, um, to do the analysis. It takes our lab about a week to do the, the first analysis. Then it goes to the state lab, which then adds on another approximately a week. So a, a two week delay and when we find out that we've had these cases, again, doesn't help us very much because you could have a person go into a lot of different um, events or locations at that point. Um, so um, th that's a frustration point. It just you know, reminds us that we, we still want to be diligent um, and really encourage people to um, take use of the vaccine. Anyone age 16 plus is eligible. Um, and that, that still continues to be our best defense against, um, against COVID. So um, speaking of vaccine, um, a, a couple key updates. First, Pfizer has submitted a request to the FDA to um, revise their eligible age ranges um, going down to 12 rather than 16 based on their um, phase three clinical trials that, um, that all came back very positive. Um, we're, we're watching, waiting for this approval process. Once it does happen, we'll reach out and work with our schools like we've been starting to do now for our 16 plus um, to really capture those high schools if, um, if parents are interested in having students vaccinated at those events. Um, and we'll work closely with our schools while we're um, hosting those events in addition to, of course, any of our community-based pods. Um, also um, disappointing, um, we received notice um, late yesterday, early this morning regarding um, the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the FDA and CDC's call to pause the administration of that vaccine um, due to reports. There are six reports of rare and severe blood clotting, um, all in um, female recipients of the vaccine, all below 49 years old. Um, we did have a number of events scheduled um, using Johnson & Johnson. What we're doing is swapping out those with um, Pfizer vaccine. Um, that does require that we'll make some adjustments on second doses to make sure that we're going back. Um, it, it slows down some of our, our response in, in community because it means instead of going once and being able to go to the, the next community, we'll, we'll go there, schedule the second one, go to our next community, but then come back. Um, so our, our hope to address that is to continue to bring online more mobile um, teams that are um, working with our, our local health providers, working with our partners um, to be um, doing those community-based pods right alongside us. Tim, do you know offhand what percentage of our doses were J&J &J or how many doses we have? Um, I apologize, I don't have the inventory number in front of me, but I, I want to say around, we're holding about 9,000 doses of J&J, of, of &J, between six to 9,000, but I, I, again, that fluctuates based on what we send out, what we might be holding for um, a partner or a future event, but I, I can confirm that as well. I, I recall um, at the beginning of all this, I remember Moderna had put a pause on a, on a lot of Moderna uh, because of some reactions in the San Diego County area. So kind of the same thing. They're going to wait and see. Yeah, the, the difference, um, and, and you're absolutely right, um, that was an issue early on in Moderna. I, I think, if I remember correctly, at that point, California was the only um, you know, state to say um, they're going to pause the Moderna, whereas this is a little more concerning because this is coming from FDA, CDC, and really pushing for a nationwide pause. Um, so that definitely, um, it, it will likely slow down that review process. So we're probably talking about um, weeks or a month at, at least before we get clearance on being able to use it or not. Um, whereas with the Moderna, the state moved pretty quickly and we had that back within a week. Thank you. <clears throat> And then um, OptumServe, we, um, we again continue to have what I, what I continue to bring back to this board is, is challenges. Last week, early Mart, um, what was a, a problem area? Clink Citrus was a problem area. Um, we've 
what we've asked for at this point is a meeting with um, the state team without Optum representatives there to really try and address you know, we feel like we're, we're continuing to bring up our, our concerns and issues to the team. Um, however, none of those ever get resolved. Um, and, and we're kind of in this quandary of the amount of, of staff time, we, we could probably do it better. Um, but we also recognize that um, we don't want to disrupt our mobile-based operations on that side either by taking on some fixed sites where we know our our in the field mobile based um, vaccine efforts are, are where we're getting the most demand, where we're making the most impact within our communities. It's smaller doses on average, although again, the communities really are turning out, um, but we, we feel that that's you know, our best approach to make sure we're, we're distributing the vaccine to as, as many equitably across the county. So, um, if there are no questions on vaccine, I, I can move on. I had um, just a update on the county tier status. Um, so what the, the state did make an, an additional adjustment to their tier structure or more or less when counties move within a tier. Um, this actually is a positive change um, in so much as um, they won't, the, the state will not automatically move a county back to a more restrictive tier if our, if say our metrics move back toward the red tier. Instead, what the um, what CDPH is gonna look at is a 10 day snapshot of our trending, looking at hospitalizations, ICU, um, looking at the um, you know signs of stability or improvement. So it's not an automatic, you go to a more restrictive tier. I, I think they're taking a more um, thoughtful approach that hopefully um, if it plays out like it did for some of these types of discussions early in the pandemic, it allows us to more or less paint a picture of why we, we might disagree with um, a more strict lockdown <clears throat> or where locally we feel our, our response um, doesn't reflect in, in the information or the data. And then the only other update that I would note on guidance based on Supreme Court ruling um, on churches, there was um, an adjustment that basically said um, enforcement and capacity for any, um, you know, in this case, places of worship, but the language that the state used was any, um, any sector that's kind of enjoined within a court battle um, would be, the, the capacity limits would not, would not be mandatory, but instead a strong recommendation. And that concludes my report. I told you I was brief today. Wow. All right. Do we have any questions or comments for Tim? I just, if I can just echo your concerns with Optum Serve, um, I know that that has been an issue uh, for Ivanhoe um, and wondering um, what will come of it um, in the future in terms of our collaboration. I know. Uh, my colleagues have said in the past, as many vaccines as we can get from the state, in addition to what we already have, it's great, and I understand that as well. But there comes also a point in time where you have residents who are frustrated, waiting in line for an hour and a half. Um, and, like that's what happened this past weekend when I was in Ivanhoe and asked two ladies who were there, had been waiting an hour and a half, and were still waiting in line in order to start the process for their vaccine. Um, and so it just pains me sometimes to see the, the dysfunction of the, the Optum Serve site um, and don't really want to put our residents through those uh, challenging times. So again, I think it's great that you said you're going to have a discussion with the state in order to see if there is potential to remedy the situation. Um, and the reason why is that LHI is an organization based out of Pennsylvania. And so, and, and these uh, um, opportunities are given to RNs or LVNs and, and they get to decide whether or not they want to partake in this weekend vaccination clinic. But hey, Friday they can say, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. And then Saturday decide they wake up and say, you know what, I don't feel like going today after all. So there's no level of consistency. Um, and so I, my hope is that you will have fruitful conversations 
uh, with regards to our Optum sites here in Tulare County. And I <clears throat> appreciate and share that sentiment exactly. Um, regardless of, of whose name it is doing the vaccination, um, our residents associate it with a, a Tulare County event. And we've worked very hard to try and make a positive, um, a, as painless as possible, no, no pun intended with the shot in the arm, um, vaccine experience. And this, this does reflect poorly, um, regardless of, of who the, the owner is. I, and I certainly can tell you from, from a lot of my team's perspective, they would like to more or less ditch Optum and, and develop our own, our own system in its place. Um, I just want to make sure that we have a sustainable path forward. So the, the first step to that really is our conversation with just the state of that this is clearly not working. We need to make some changes um, because we're having major disconnects. It's, it's really damaging um, relationships with some of our community-based organizations that we worked very hard to develop. And um, we continually are, are getting put in the middle because we want it to be successful. We don't want it to fail. Um, but uh, you know, there comes that point that enough is enough, and we, we need to we need to see something different. Supervisor McCarry. Uh, Tim, you know the media is reporting a large spike in children. Uh, are we seeing that in our county uh, of positive cases involving children? Um, we haven't seen a large spike in our cases with children at this point. Um, going back to um, our cumulative cases um, didn't change significantly from last um, from last report. We have 13 active youth cases right now, and um, again, very small numbers, relatively speaking. So we haven't really seen that uptick. Um, we're not having a lot of schools that are needing to quarantine or, or close at this point either. Okay, good. I, and thank you to your staff for the hard work. I appreciate it. Supervisor Vanderpool. Uh, real quick, uh, just thank you, obviously, to your staff. I think you guys are doing a great job. Uh, the Optum meeting, I think, is very important. Um, I'm glad that you've requested to get Optum out of the room. Um, in general, I know there have been some hiccups and it's been you know, a, a relatively negative experience. I wouldn't push them out completely if there is the potential to resolve because ultimately what this is about is getting as many residents who want to be vaccinated, vaccinated. And because our Optum sites are located in communities that, are, um, you know, that don't have uh, typically that infrastructure uh, to push vaccinations, uh, I think it's a very important piece to not just shun it away completely, but be very uh, thoughtful and careful in how we uh, proceed forward with that. Um, but you're, you made the point, and I think it's the overall message that needs to be uh, really pushed out there. When there's a negative experience in this arena, it automatically reflects on the county, whether it, the sign says Optum or it says Tulare County. Uh, it comes back to Tulare County, and we have done such a great job and really have been a rock star uh, in the world of vaccinations and how we have handled this process, uh, especially compared to our neighboring counties and other California counties. So um, we definitely want to try to preserve that reputation. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if not just for the, the simple basic fact that your staff has worked so hard, any blemish on that reputation is, is not deserved. Um, and that, you know, is something that I hold very high. So uh, again, appreciate the work. Um, just you know, proceed carefully, but uh, uh, we definitely know that uh, the need is there to continue to vaccinate uh, and to reach as many different communities as we possibly can. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Thank you also again to your staff. Thank you. Okay, our next item on the agenda is public comment. Members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda. Under state law, matters presented under this item cannot be discussed or acted upon by the board at this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the public is invited to make comments when the item comes up for board consideration. Please complete and submit a card indicating your interest in that particular agenda item. Any person addressing the board will be limited to a maximum of three minutes so that all interested parties have an opportunity to speak with a total of 15 minutes uh, allotted for comment time. 
At all times, please use the microphone, state your name and address for the record. Do we have anybody in chambers today that would like to speak for public comments? Okay, Madam Clerks, do we have uh, any phone calls? Madam Chair, there are no calls. Okay, then we will move on to our next item, which is the consent calendar. Are there any items to be pulled? I am pulling item 10 for separate consideration. Do we have any other items to be pulled? Okay, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Valero, a second by Supervisor Macari. Please cast your votes. And motion passes 5-0. Okay, um, just I have a question regarding item 10. I know our last meeting, uh, we did the bid opening um, and uh, Westscapes was the low bidder at 659,416, but the engineer's estimate was 300,000. So I'm just, when things are double than what we had estimated, I'm just curious as to, you know, what, what the differences are, if there were changes from the estimate and whatnot. Um, Hi, Kyle. Yeah. So I'll, I'll try to answer that as best I can. Um, I'm Kyle Taylor with the General Services Agency. Um, there's a few different reasons why the cost is, is, is significantly higher that, that we can um, see. There were a handful of items in the plans and the final set of bid plans that were not included in the estimate. So some of those are uh, uh, the walking path was shown as an alternate and didn't have a cost in the cost estimate, but it ended up in the final plan. So there's an employee walking path that wasn't in the cost estimate. There are some drainage improvements along the building and the, and the driveways. There were some, some areas where we noticed that the cut wasn't deep enough to take the amount of mulch that was called out, so we added some additional cuts, um, earthwork around the driveways and, and the building. And then there was, uh, we added a, a gravel drive from the fire road to where the facilities workers park um, to dress up that area and, and, and help with, with the drainage. So that's some of the things. And then also, too, we're, we're currently in, we're seeing on the construction side a very high bid environment currently. Um, a lot of that is due to, to COVID. Uh, there's been a tremendous increase in the amount of, of construction goods. Um, for example, we've seen certain things like lumber and copper, those kinds of things go up as much as 200% in the last year. Um, if you go to like Home Depot and look at the cost of lumber, what it was a year ago, it's, it's super high. So, and that's kind of across the board with a lot of the um, building trade materials. So that's one of the reasons. Um, another one, contractors are really busy right now. There's, there's a lot of construction work. So when, you, when they're extremely busy and not hungry for work, that, that uh, also tends to, to drive up the, the price. And then lastly, I wanna mention, just in the last, even pre-COVID, we were seeing a, a significant increase in cost of construction. For example, like with South County Detention Facility, you know, when we were building and, and estimating that project, which was finished only two years ago, the hardened gel portion, the most expensive part of the construction, we were estimating at about $525 a square foot. We're now paying that same cost on prefab metal buildings on the last two that we did. And we're estimating, uh, you know, new construction, you know, from the county side to be upwards of $600 a square foot. So just across the board, everything has, has significantly increased. And then lastly, I just want to mention, you know, the estimate could have potentially been somewhat low when it was done, you know, because we are doing approximately 4.6 acres of, of, uh, of landscaping, irrigated landscaping, you know, 3,500 shrubs, 332 trees, plus the, all the mulch and, and everything else. So it, it is a significantly large project that will really dress up that building and make it look nice. Well, I, I appreciate the thoroughness of your explanation, and it, it does make sense. I have been hearing that, um, you know, in a lot of different sectors, mm -hmm. the cost of things going up. So I, I appreciate that. Um, if there aren't any other questions, Thank I you. will entertain a motion. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you I'll move for approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Vanderpool. Yeah, I, by me. And uh, a second by Valero. <laughs> Please catch your vote.
Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. All right, now we're on to our untimed items. Our first is to receive a presentation by the Health and Human Services Agency Mental Health Branch regarding assisted outpatient treatment, Laura's Law. Good morning. Good morning, nice Donna. Good morning, everyone, this morning. Good morning, Chairman, Chairwoman, members Hold of on. the board. Daniel. Are you okay with removing your mask? If you'd like me to, I can. I think we can hear you better that way. Thank you. So good morning, Chairwoman, members of the board. You can hear me a lot better, huh? <laughs> to the board, CAO, and council. I'm Donna Ortiz, the mental health director, and I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to present to you today the Assisted Outpatient Treatment Program, also known as Laura's Law. And if I may, I did want to take a moment to introduce to you the mental health clinical team, team who is behind me. I have Natalie Bowen, the, de uh, the de Deputy Director for Administration, Casey Ennis, Division Manager of Direct Clinical Services, Dr. Alyssa Huff, our lead psychologist who oversees our mental health court and LPS conservatorship, and Angie Tipton, our budget officer assisting with our mental health fiscal, re fiscal responsibilities. I wanted to provide a few salient points and then Ms. Ennis will cover the presentation in detail for your consideration. This team has been working for several months in collaboration with the Tulare County Superior Court on the possibility of assisted outpatient treatment services here in Tulare County. These services are, to, are, to, are meant to assist our most vulnerable population. The intent of the program is to provide intensive outpatient treatment in hopes of reducing the need for a more restrictive, higher level of care, to reduce traumatizing experiences associated with crisis and as everyone is aware, during the pandemic, many individuals have struggled with coping with isolation, have an increase of drug use and alcohol use, and individuals have experienced reoccurring hospitalizations. We have seen a significant increase in not only our child, children's crisis, but adults as well. And our goal is to engage with individuals and offer this program to those that qualify so that they can reside safely in our community and improve their overall well-being. I will now pass it over to Casey Ennis to share more about the program. Thank you. Good morning, Sh Chairwoman Shuklian, members of the board, CAO, and council. I'm going to get the PowerPoint up just very quickly. Okay. So I'm going to be providing an overview of assisted outpatient treatment, also known as Laura's Law, and how this can help us in Tulare County, providing an additional tool to help a small population of at-risk adults. Assembly Bill 1421, or Laura's Law, was passed in 2002 following the murder of Laura Wilcox, a social worker in California, and three others by a seriously mentally ill individual who was refusing treatment. Assembly Bill 1421 allows for counties in California to opt in to Laura's Law, or assisted outpatient treatment. As defined by the Wellness and Institutions Code 5345 through 49.5, assisted outpatient treatment, or AOT, is court-mandated intensive outpatient services available by referral and county authorization to treatment-refusing individuals with serious mental illness who have a recent history of arrest and or psychiatric hospitalization and are at risk of further deterioration, disability, or harm to self or others. In September of 2020, Assembly Bill 1976 was passed and now counties are required to opt out of AOT with a resolution adopted by the County Board of Supervisors if implementation would reduce existing mandated specialty mental health programs serving adults or children. AOT is an evidence-based practice that would be an additional tool to, for Tulare County Mental Health to serve the most at-risk, vulnerable individuals in our community. The AOT program would consist of court-ordered treatment and intensive outpatient service, services. It's important to note that AOT would be handled in civil court, 
and there would be no harsh penalties associated with individuals who are not engaging in these services. The goals of AOT include helping individuals who have little or no awareness of their mental illness and helping them access needed mental health services. Helping AOT participants achieve wellness and recovery goals according to their treatment plan and to prevent relapses, repeated hospitalizations, incarcerations, victimizations, suicide, and danger to others. Currently, 45 states have some form of court-ordered outpatient treatment for individuals with serious mental illness. In the state of California, as of 2019, 19 counties have implemented AOT, and this was before Assembly Bill 1976. There is research and evidence that supports being ordered by someone in authority, such as a judge, to participate in treatment motivates individuals to engage and participate in their services. Research also indicates that there is significant reductions for program participants in arrests, victimizations, hospitalizations, and minor acts of violence. AOT services allow for whole person care needs to be addressed by care coordination and research demonstrates overall better health outcomes for participants. AOT is a tool to help individuals before moving to the most restrictive level of care, conservatorship. AOT would be the highest level of outpatient service for the Tulare County Mental Health Branch. Candidates for AOT are referred to the program and must meet specific criteria to be enrolled, which will be covered in a later slide. AOT is only used until a participant is well enough to maintain their treatment independently and willingly. They are then stepped down to a lower level of care. The California Behavioral Health Directors Association has advised that on average five to eight consumers per 100,000 residents can be expected, expected to enroll annually and typically 25 referrals can be expected each year. A civil order for AOT treatment is only pursued following 30 days of outreach efforts. Outreach is an attempt to build trust and rapport with an individual in order to voluntarily engage them in outpatient services. Following, following enrollment to AOT, the director or designee of the AOT program will file an affidavit every 60 days to affirm the need for continued treatment. The mental health branch would be required to annually report data and outcomes of the program to the California Department of Healthcare Services. Each county has the opportunity to opt out of the AOT program at the beginning of every fiscal year um, if the continuing the program detracts from other mandated services. The Department of Healthcare Services requires counties going live with AOT this July to also have a training program to teach community members and partners about assisted outpatient services and criteria for participation in the program. While the program includes court-mandated treatment, a participant's rights are protected and include the following, to receive adequate notice of the hearings, to receive a copy of court-ordered evaluations, to receive counsel, to be informed of their rights to judicial review by habeas corpus, to be present at the hearing unless the right is waived, to present evidence, to call witnesses, to appeal decisions. In order to be enrolled in AOT, referrals need to outline that each of the following criteria are met for the individual. They are 18 or older, they have a mental illness, they're unlikely to survive safely without supervision, they have a lack of compliance with treatment, a history of that, and they have a deteriorating condition. Additionally, we are going to be looking that the referral include one of the following. In the last 36 months, the individual has required two hospitalizations or placement in a correctional facility due to their mental illness, or the person's mental illness has resulted in one or more attempts or threats of serious and violent behavior towards self or others within the last 48 months. Lastly, please note that the criteria must be met following the 30 days of outreach efforts. Outreach by mental health staff includes face-to-face -face visits where the consumer resides, and efforts to engage the individual, supplementing with telehealth or telephonically when necessary. The goal of outreach is to build rapport and trust with the individual and to engage that person in services voluntarily whenever possible. Many counties that have implemented AOT share that dedicated outreach efforts for at least 30 days have helped at-risk individuals access mental health services without a court order. Referrals can be made by the following, judges, adult family members or support persons residing with an individual, mental health director or designee, peace officers, 
parole or probation officer supervising the individual, and if a referral is received from another source, the Tulare County AOT team would review the individual's history and attempt to secure a referral from one of the sources listed. All referrals will be reviewed by the AOT team to determine if criteria is met. Trainings, including a PowerPoint and handouts, will be offered at least annually to groups and agencies that will provide referrals to the department to ensure full understanding of the parameters of the program. I would also like to note this program is of great benefit for family members. Family members who struggle to support loved ones who refuse mental health treatment. Many times, family members are serving as caregivers for adults with serious mental illness and have little or no support when their loved one refuses help. This program provides benefit and ultimately hope to family members who want loved ones to get the help that they need. An overview of the program workflow is provided. Following a referral to the program, the individual's history will be reviewed by the AOT committee, which will include the program lead and treatment team. If criteria is not met or outreach for 30 days hasn't been done, outreach and engagement services will be scheduled. If criteria is met, the individual will be contacted and offered services. If the individual engages in services voluntarily, specialty mental health services will be scheduled. If the individual refuses, a petition will be filed by county council with civil court to order AOT. And following a court hearing, the individual would be enrolled in the program. For individuals who are referred to the program, we will enlist our assertive community, train, uh, excuse me, community treatment team, or ACT, our Homeless Outreach Proactive Engagement, or HOPE, clinician, and our newly forming, forming County Homeless MDT team to provide the 30 days of outreach when needed. ACT team will be providing treatment and services to AOT participants. ACT is an intensive field-based service modality that uses a multidisciplinary team to connect people to resources in the community along with providing mental health treatment. An ACT team consists of, at a minimum, a psychologist, clinician, drug and alcohol specialist, case manager, and peer support specialist. And APT has a whatever it takes philosophy. Services would include case management to link people to services, therapy, substance use disorder counseling, life skills building, psychiatry referrals, and multidisciplinary staffings with community partners such as law enforcement, housing specialists, vocational specialists, and others who can contribute to each participant's whole person care needs. Currently, there is not a dedicated funding source for this program. However, the Mental Health Branch will use a combination of Mental Health Services Act or MHSA funds, Medi-Cal reimbursement or federal financial participation match, and 1991 realignment dollars to implement. The Mental Health Branch has completed a financial analysis of the cost of this program, and we will be dedicating 13% of MHSA dollars, 10% Medi-Cal reimbursement, and 77% 1991 funds to support the first year piloting AOT. We will seek to provide more billable services after implementation, thereby reducing the support, support of 1991 realignment funds and increasing Medi-Cal reimbursement dollars. Additionally, with changes to Medi-Cal known as California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal, or CalAIM, next year there will be new billing, billing revenue streams such as enhanced care management, and in lieu of services that can be used to further fund the program. We as a branch would continue to gauge the sustainability of this program prior to the beginning of each fiscal year when there's an opportunity to opt out if it's determined that other services or programs would need to be reduced to continue to run it. Published research from an AOT program in New York demonstrates that costs of running the program continue to decrease within the first two years of implementation as billing increase. Also, the cost of AOT services was more than offset by savings from psychiatric hospitalizations. Cost savings for AOT participants was nearly doubled than that of those engaged in traditional mental health services. Additionally, financial analysis of an AOT program in San Francisco demonstrates an estimated monthly cost savings of more than $400,000 from the 120 AOT participants as utilization of psychiatric emergency services, inpatient hospitalizations, and incarcerations were significantly reduced. Lastly, in Nevada County, AOT participant outcomes after 12 months included psychiatric hospital days reduced by 46.7%, Days of incarceration reduced by 65.1%, and emergency room interventions reduced by 44.1%. This is the end of my presentation. 
The Tulare County Mental Health Branch respectfully requests approval to implement a pilot of assisted outpatient treatment in Tulare County or to opt out of the program with the board resolution according to legislation requirements as outlined in Assembly Bill 1976. Any questions? All right, I see if, thank you very much for the very thorough presentation. Supervisor Vanderpool. Thank you, I uh, appreciate this presentation and it's really kind of a, a full circle for, for me because I know that uh, after serving on the mental health board uh, uh, for eight years, I believe, um, during that time I know I was approached numerous times by uh, individual members of the board who had adult uh, children and really would have benefited from Laura's Law and we, we had the conversations, we had uh, the due diligence into the program uh, but it was then thought to be financially unfeasible uh, and that the costs could be uh, exponential and uh, out, outside of our realm of uh, being able to meet. But uh, uh, this is a, a complete turnaround. Um, the fact that you sound supportive of, of this program in the uh, uh, presentation at least, I think that uh, uh, gives me some optimism. Um, the uh, fact that there are actual proven studies showing cost savings uh, versus incarceration and uh, inpatient treatment, um, I think that's, uh, that's a reason for optimism. But, but for me, uh, the reason that I will be supportive is I like the fact there's an annual opt-out. Mm -hmm. So we enter into this program, we give it a shot, we find that the costs really don't match the studies and, and these costs are uh, uncontrollable here in Tulare County hey, we can opt out next year. But um, I do think that to the benefit of the individuals who would qualify for this program uh, and could benefit from AOT, uh, I believe this is worth a shot. Um, I think we should give them uh, that support uh, and, and benefit because I think that there are some individuals who really would need this service uh, and, and the community as a whole, the county as a whole could benefit from this program. So I, I would be very supportive. Thank you. Supervisor McCarty. I just want to say how excited I am to finally see this come to fruition. Uh, actually, this is one reason why I ran. Many, many years of, throughout my law enforcement career, I've sat back and watched the society and the people be continuously victimized by a system that just let them fall through the cracks. You know, one of the criteria is that they're not receptive to treatment. Well, the problem is they don't know they need treatment because they're mentally ill, and that's one of the criteria. So when you have a voluntary system, for a person who's mentally ill to receive treatment, it doesn't work because they don't know. So I am so excited to see this happening, and uh, I think you're going to be a lot busier than what you you think you're going to be. <laughs> don't scare them, Larry. Thank you, <laughs> Supervisor Townsend. Yeah, and actually, I did want to echo uh, a lot of that. I, um, from the time I was running, and and, and even uh, running for the for the office, and even now. Um, you know, people will ask about uh, this very thing. Um, we'll ask about these programs, and and uh, as Supervisor McCarty said, there's there's just so many that fall through the cracks. And so, um, this does sound like it'll be a good program um, that will help those individuals. And and as you stated, it'll help the families. Um, and those are the ones that that are reaching out, saying we don't know what to do uh, from here. So uh, happy to see another option, and hopefully it can uh, fill that void that's been out there. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor Valero. Yep. Just briefly echoing what all of my colleagues have said, this is a long time coming and I fully support the work that we will be able to do with this and so thank you so much. Okay, um, of course I too have had many people come up to me and, and ask, you know, when is the, the county going to initiate Laura's Law um, and for the purposes and reasons that Supervisor Vanderpool has always already stated, um, I, I was in agreement. I'm happy to see this. I do have a couple of questions. Um, in your presentation, you said that 19 other counties in California are participating already. Do we have any idea what the outcomes are um, here in California with this program? Yeah, so um, the information from San Francisco and Nevada County was actually pulled from some of the reports shared by Department of Healthcare Services. Okay. Um, and so far, it, it is positive. There's cost savings that they're reporting monthly. Um, for those who have implemented. And we're expecting to see a whole lot more implement um, this summer because of 1976 Assembly Bill. Okay, and then the other question I have is, you know, 
from my work in the past um, in the mental health field, medication compliance was always a, a big issue for folks. Yeah. Um, how, how is that going to work in this program? Sure. So we can't mandate medication. Um, of course, the court order can include it, um, but an individual still has their right to refuse. Um, remembering that this population is significantly at risk. So if they're not taking medication and they're deteriorating, um, we would be you know, reviewing, do they meet 5150 criteria? Is it time to look at hospitalization um, following that? Um, so we will be doing all that we can with outreach and then with the AOT's uh, program to engage individuals and get them on the medications that help them. And if they're on you know, that, that boundary, that level of deteriorating and, and that's not working, then we look at the next level of care. Okay. Thank you. Um, so with that, I too am supportive of this, happy to see it uh, being implemented here in Tulare County and, and hoping that it is successful and that we don't have to opt out in a year. Um, so with that, I will entertain, oh, are there any public comments regarding this item? Madam Clerk, no? Okay, now I will entertain a motion. We already have a motion by Supervisor Macari with a second by Supervisor Valero. Please cast your votes. And the motion passes 5-0. We look forward to seeing the success of this program. Thank you. You know, uh, ma yeah. ma Madam Chair, I forgot, I did forget to mention. Um, you know, I, I know that we, uh, it was said during the uh, presentation that this would be a pilot program. Uh, would you maybe make a note to come back in, in about a year and let us know how the pilot has gone? Uh, let us know what the costs are, how effective the program has been, uh, because I do think that follow-up is, is absolutely prudent. I know you'll be doing it internally and tracking it, but a return to present to the board would be much appreciated. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Thing. You know, I'm real passionate about this. So if you have, there's events, grand openings, anything, I, I'd like to know. I want to, I want to attend, I want to participate and help. So please let me know. Thanks. I think that's ditto for all of us. Thank you, Supervisor. Okay. Uh, with that, we are moving on to item 21, which is a request from the county administrative office to approve the annual salary for the position of Director of Human Resources and Development in Bargaining Unit 10 in the amount of $130,000 with the same standard benefits provided to Bargaining Unit 10 employees and an additional benefit of auto allowance of $443 monthly effective April 25th, 2021. Mr. Britt. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. That concludes my report. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the board, Jason Britt, County Administrative Officer. This item is before you in order to comply with government code section 54953C3, in which the board must orally, or its designee must orally announce uh, recommended final compensation for um, local department executives. So we are asking for an approval of the annual salary for the position of director of human resources and development for the amount of $130,000 with the same standard benefits provided to bargaining unit 10 employees and additional benefit of an auto allowance at 443 monthly effective April 25th, 2021. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Do we have any questions? Do we have any public comment regarding this item? Madam Chair, directly after the board takes action, I do have a report out of closed session for this that's connected to this item, if if I may. Okay, then. Yes, you may. After the action. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> okay, so with that, I will t entertain a motion. Yeah. Oh, okay. holy cow. I'll second. <laughs> Everybody fought over the motion. I'll take Man. a second. I mean, geez. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, popular. That was a popular one, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Townsend, a second by Supervisor, um, this guy, uh, Vanderpool. <laughs> Please cast your votes. And motion passes 5-0. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, announcing, Jason Britt announcing out for a previous closed session. On April 7th, 2021, the Board of Supervisors took took action in a personnel matter to appoint Lupe Garza in the position of Human Resources and Development Director, effective April 25th, 2021. The vote was taken upon motion of Supervisor Vanderpool, seconded by Supervisor Valero. The motion was approved 5-0. That concludes the report. All right.
and Ms. Garza is in the audience today. Um, Lupe, would you like to come up and introduce yourself and share anything you'd like to share? Well, I'm Lupe Garza. Um, I've been with the county and human resources and development since 2010, working primarily in the benefits area. And um, this past year has just been a tremendous learning for me with all these different um, challenges between COVID and not having a director in place. So I really thank you for the opportunity you've given me and the confidence you've instilled in me. And um, I will not let you um, or the CAO down in this position. But so thank you very much. Do we have any comments? Obviously, uh, the board has a lot of confidence in you, and uh, we're very to ha happy to have you in the position. I know personally, you've always been uh, very responsive uh, to me and my requests and, and, and able to find the information that, that I've requested. Um, so with that, yes, Supervisor Vanderpool. I, and I was just going to personally congratulate you too, Lupe. I think that uh, you have seen numerous HR directors uh, here at the county during your tenure. Uh, you've seen the good, you've seen the bad, and I think you've learned quite a bit and you presented that in your uh, interview. And uh, I know this is something you're very passionate about. And uh, I have the utmost faith and confidence in the work that you will be doing as the new director. So thank you. Congratulations. All right, congratulations. Uh, I know that since early on when I got on to the board, you have followed me every step of the way, making sure uh, that things are, um, are to the best of their ability. And so I just want to thank you for uh, really working hard, your tenacity, your drive, and your willingness to take on a new leadership role for the county and representing the county and human resources and development. And I know that, um, that you will do extremely well in your position. And uh, I just wish you continued success as you navigate the department and work through uh, the upcoming challenges still with COVID, but then seeing that light at the end of the tunnel and being able to make sure that, um, yeah, the county is healthy, well, and moving forward. Thank you. Supervisor Townsend. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Lupe, thank you, and congratulations. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I think everybody recognized in, in the interviews and in your work uh, with the department, uh, your concern for and your heart, really your heart, for the county and for your department. And I think that really shined through in, uh, in our interview uh, with you, and uh, we look forward to the, the good things that you have to, uh, to bring to the table, and we're, we're just expecting those good things. So Supervisor McCarry. Uh, Luby, congratulations. And you know, when I came back to the county, you were the first person that uh, contacted and set everything up. And I was very impressed how things, uh, you put things together and got it going. And actually we had a little hiccup when I, when I first came on. And not only was I told of the hiccup, I was told that you already had the solution to avoid it in the future. So I mean, you were right on it and very impressive. And I look forward to working with you. Thank you, I All appreciate right. it. Thank you, Lupe. Thank you so much. All right, our next item is board matter requests. Board members may make a referral to staff to have a matter of business be considered for a future agenda. Anybody have any board member requests this week? All right, seeing none. Madam Council, do we have a need for closed session? Yes, Chair, we do have a need for closed session. Items F and G are off calendar. The balance will be heard in closed session, and I do anticipate an announcement out. Okay, well with that, a meeting adjourned. Thank you all for being here and we'll see you next week.
As to item C, heard in closed session, um, the Board of Supervisors authorized the defense of individually named defendants, including any county employees subsequently named with a reservation of rights in the action of Maria Elena Garcia et al. versus County of Tulare et al., U.S. District Court uh, in the Eastern District of California, Action 21-CB-00482. The adverse parties are Maria Elena Garcia, Adriana Garcia, CG through his guardian ad litem, SG through her guardian ad litem, JG through her guardian ad litem, and Gloria Garcia. The case involves an alleged violation of civil rights. The uh, motion was made by Supervisor McCarry. It was seconded by Supervisor Townsend and it was unanimously passed. As to item D, the Board of Supervisors authorized the defense of individually named defendants, including county employees subsequently named in the action with a reservation of rights in Patricia Sanchez as guardian ad litem for JG versus County of Tulare et al. Tulare County Superior Court case number VCU 286277. The adverse party is JG, a minor by and through his guardian ad litem, Patricia Sanchez. The case involves alleged violations of the Penal Code and California Department of Social Services Manual of Policies and Procedures in connection with the Child Welfare Services matter. The motion was made by Supervisor McCarry. It was seconded by Supervisor Valero, and it was unanimously passed. 